Hello, I'm Ed Duesenberry, first violinist of the Tokach Quartet. We are very sorry not to be able to play for you in person at the Library of Congress, but instead we've come up with three video presentations. We will be playing a concert program of the Schubert Quartet Zatz, the very exciting Bartok First Quartet, and ending with Beethoven's masterpiece Opus 132. We will also be having a very interesting conversation with experts at the library about the manuscript page of Opus 131 in the library. But today I'm talking about the book that I wrote back in 2016, Beethoven for a Later Age, Living with the String Quartets, that was published by the University of Chicago Press. And of course, it's the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, so this is an appropriate topic. When I was in the early stages of writing this book, my wonderful editor, who helped me develop the project, told me that it read too much like a memoir, and to put it bluntly, I wasn't nearly famous enough to write a memoir. And in particular, she said there were too many stories about my American grandmother. Now, my grandmother may not have made it into the book, but that means I can talk about her today. When she first came to hear me play in Boulder, Colorado, after I joined the Tokach Quartet, her post-concert observation was succinct. I had no idea you would be on stage for such a long time. She was an extraordinary woman who lived to the age of 106, and I've always wondered whether her at times delightful lack of tact played a role in her longevity. How many years do must most of us waste worrying about how exactly to say something, or perhaps worrying afterwards that we've expressed something in a less than ideal manner? My grandmother didn't seem to worry too much. When we played an experimental program of poetry and 20th century music in 2001, after the concert, she said simply, I didn't like the music and I couldn't hear the poetry. I mention her today partly to remind me not to talk for too long and mainly because her post-concert reactions get at the heart of one of the themes in my book about Beethoven's quartets and my experiences playing them in the Tokach. Beethoven's quartets confound expectations, whether the expectations of their first players and audiences, or indeed my own expectations when I started to work on them as a member of the Tokach 23 years ago. One violinist expressed the opinion to Beethoven that the Opus 59s, composed in 1806 and commissioned by the Russian ambassador in Vienna, Count Razumovsky, were not music. A cellist apparently threw his music to the floor in a rage, objecting to being assigned a melody to play all on his own that was no more than a rhythm on one note. Early reviews of Beethoven's middle period works complained of lawlessness, chaos, and lack of comprehensibility. The first years of the 19th century were certainly chaotic. Europe was in the throes of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon's army invaded Vienna in 1805 and 1809. Describing the second invasion, Beethoven wrote, What a destructive, disorderly life I see and hear around me. Nothing but drums, cannons and human misery in every form. And yet, a reviewer of the, his Opus 74 string quartet, written during this period, did not want to hear any instability or disorientation reflected in the music. It should cheer our minds with its soft, pleasing play of fantasy. In 1889, the novelist Leo Tolstoy would take up the question of what one could rightly expect from a piece of music in his novella, The Kreutzer Sonata. Listening to the first movement of Beethoven's sonata of that name, the protagonist complains that the music disturbs and agitates him, takes him into an unnatural space that is not his own. So these were listeners complaining of being taken out of their comfort zone, 
being thrown in at the deep end and not immediately enjoying the experience. Much of the first half of my book is about me being thrown in to the deep end, the experience of auditioning as a 24 year old for the Tokach Quartet and the subsequent challenges of integrating myself into the group. One of the problems was how to replace the charismatic founding first violinist Gabor Tokach Nodge, an inspiring musician and now a very successful conductor. When I went to a concert in Boulder shortly after I moved here, I heard two audience members discussing my audition concert. That new first violinist, he's not nearly passionate enough. Her companion nodded with a resigned look. Yeah, well, he's from England. More recently, writing this book also felt like being thrown in the deep end. One of the main challenges was to find a good balance between memoir, stories about my grandmother or not, and the story of how the Beethoven Quartet came to be written. I tell the story of the Tokach Quartet, how from its formation in Budapest in 1975, the group came to settle in Colorado, and what my own experience was joining an established group, being the first non-Hungarian and some 15 years younger than the other players. One of the things that helped me in those early days was that I was becoming increasingly interested in the history of the Beethoven quartets, the first players, the audiences, and Beethoven's patrons. When I felt the spotlight shining too ferociously on me as a new first violinist, I could remind myself that I was part of a long tradition of musicians who have found string quartets a fulfilling, but at times fragile and difficult enterprise. In particular, I enjoyed learning about the violinist Ignaz Schuppensich, who Beethoven met in the early 1790s, shortly after he moved to Vienna. Schuppensich was closely involved in the first rehearsals and performances of Beethoven's chamber music, beginning with the Opus 1 piano trios, and then Beethoven's first string quartets, the six Opus 18s, composed in 1798-9. In 1808, Count Razumovsky, who had commissioned the Opus 59 quartets, asked Schuppensick to form a string quartet that could be in residence at his palace, thus creating a better rehearsal environment and a piece where Beethoven could work with the musicians on this challenging music. Count Razumovsky himself was a keen amateur violinist and I think fancied being the second violinist in this group, but it soon became clear to him that he was not quite up to the task and it was probably much more comfortable for the other musicians when he stepped aside and Schuppensich chose instead one of his students. Schuppensich was just as involved in the first performances of the late string quartets in 1825 and 1826. Indeed, his return from St. Petersburg after an absence of several years was one of the factors that encouraged Beethoven to turn his attention back to quartets during the last years of his life. Reading about Schuppensich was, however, not always an encouraging experience. After the first unsuccessful performance of Opus 127, Beethoven fired Schuppensich. The other musicians in the quartet chose a Hungarian violinist, Joseph Böhm, to replace him for the second performance. Perhaps there weren't any English violinists in town. When I was thinking about how to tell the story of the Tokach Quartet, I found that Beethoven's music was often present during pivotal moments. For example, the quartet won its first international competition in England playing a middle Beethoven quartet. When the Tokach asked me to audition, it was one of the Opus 59 quartets with which we finished my concert. As some of you may know, in 1995, the founding violist of the group, Gabor Ormai, died of cancer. The last piece of music we rehearsed with him was a Beethoven slow movement. In fact, I mentioned Gabor's name today. Behind me is a print of the Alban Berg String Quartet, uh, another famous group, um, and Gabor picked this up at a garage sale in Boulder um, and told a very funny story about it. He, after he first came to Boulder, loved to go to garage sales 
just so that he could bargain. Uh, so he was very happy to find this print, but the price was already only 50 cents. But as a matter of principle, Gabor had to haggle. So his argument was to the seller, come on, who plays classical string quartets nowadays? And the seller said, yeah, fair enough, and gave it to him for a quarter. It's a nice story with which to remember Gabor by. Most quartets that have been around for 40 years suffer personnel changes and have to revisit questions of musical identity and how to balance change and continuity. Beethoven quartets are particularly well suited to be life companions because they too grapple with the balance between unity and contrast, continuity and change. This is what the first listeners had trouble with, particularly in the middle and later quartets. The extreme range of emotion, contrast of mood, and the complexity of the relationship between the voices. Beethoven's brother once remarked that he would need to listen to one of the late quartets four times in a row just though, so that he could focus on each of the parts sufficiently. There was so much going on. In the many ways that Beethoven handles the interactions between the four parts, he tackles questions that we all deal with in our everyday lives. When do I have a leading role? When do I have an accompanying role? Sometimes the music seems to suggest cooperative dialogue, at other times, disruptive argument. At times, the music requires the individual voices to be subservient in the interests of a unified approach. But with four musical lines that are entirely dependent upon each other, how can one be collaborative and yet retain a sense of individual expression? Over the last 27 years, I may have become more familiar with Beethoven's quartets, I hope so, but they are no less challenging. In fact, those first feelings of inadequacy and disorientation I had, and that some of the first audiences and players experienced, I now think are crucial in terms of how we approach a work of art, because it is in a vulnerable space, when our expectations are confounded, that we can be the most responsive to the surprise and contradictions in the music. I think this is equally true for the listeners. And I think 250 years after Beethoven's birth, that he would not want to be described as a mainstream, comfortable programming choice. Can you imagine a programming committee that sits down and have been offered a proposal of an exciting but unknown contemporary work. And someone says, well, that's great, but maybe we'll need a reassuring Beethoven piece in the second half. So I don't think Beethoven would ever have wanted to be mainstream. He wanted to shock, to disturb, and that's something perhaps we all need to remember in the way that we interpret and listen to his music. Beethoven himself was particularly proud of his late quartets in which he said very modestly that he had less lack of fantasy, in other words, more sense of improvisation and also a different type of voice leading, a way in which the voices relate to each other. I start my book um, by talking about Opus 131. And so now I'd le like to read a few excerpts from the opening chapter. Since I wrote it several years ago, I will occasionally be jumping in from the book to make additional comments. No sooner do I play the opening notes in Beethoven's late string quartet, Opus 131, than a man in the first row of London's Wigmore Hall coughs ominously. A teacher once suggested to me that coughing in an audience is inspired only by a boring performance. If that is so, this particular verdict has been reached swiftly. I wonder why the man doesn't escape from his seat. Perhaps he knows that there are no breaks between the seven movements of Opus 131. If he gets up now, the ushers may not allow him to re-enter the hall. Hopefully, both boredom and phlegm will dissipate. Now, I have to jump in right away. It's very dangerous to mention someone coughing uh, in a book, and of course, during this terrible pandemic that has a whole different connotation. But I'm afraid I got my comeuppance about a year later when uh, we were playing a concert and I myself 
got a severe coughing fit in the middle of the concert and actually had to stop playing. <laughs> so that's the last time I ever mentioned coughing in the in a writing. Back to the book. There shouldn't be anything especially taxing about the opening phrase of Opus 131. As first violinist to the Tokash Quartet, I've been playing Beethoven's 15th string quartet for a long time. I play the first 12 notes on my own. The rhythm is uncomplicated, the tempo comfortably slow, but even the simplest looking phrase is challenging. There are so many different ways one could play it. Over the last 28 years, I have received copious suggestions from my dear colleagues in the quartet. First of all, how to play that opening sforzando, an instruction to emphasize a particular note. Yeah, Ed, that sounds too aggressive. Could you try a more expressive version? Yeah, but now it sounds too easy going. It's not painful enough. How about the tempo? Yeah, that's too slow. There's no sense of line. It's just the beginning of a long story. Yeah, but Ed, now it sounds too fluent, too easy going, too impatient. What about the dynamic or type of sound? Ed, could you try playing it a bit quieter, more like an inner grief, not quite so explicit? Yeah, yeah, but not tentative. Now it sounds thin. A Beethoven phrase can make seemingly contradictory musical demands. Dramatic yet understated, slow but with a sense of direction. A private grief expressed in a hall to 500 people. No wonder that this opening melody provokes debate. The choices I make affect my colleagues' options when they come to play the same phrase. The combination of cooperation and individual expression that the opening of Opus 131 requires is central to the challenges and rewards of playing in a string quartet. Too many cooks may spoil the broth, but in a quartet, satisfying consensus can only be achieved when all four players contribute their zesty seasonings to the stew. When we return to a Beethoven quartet, continuing to argue over such basic questions of tempo and character we can seem like a group discovering this music for the first time. A friend and board member of the Corcoran's Gallery of Chamber Music Series here in DC once invited us to rehearse in his living room. Having only ever heard us play in concert, he looked stunned by the end of our rehearsal. Sometimes you guys sound like you have no idea what you're doing. But even when we engage in nerve-wracking re-examination on the day of a concert, I relish a process that helps to maintain a sense of immediacy in music we have been performing for many years. A concert may benefit from many hours of preparation, but the most exciting communication occurs when both audience and performers can suspend disbelief and discover the music afresh. The appearance of the ghost at the beginning of Hamlet would be significantly less effective if, in a whispered aside, the actor reassured the audience that the confrontation had already played out during an earlier matinee performance. Performing Opus 131 is always an adventure. Over the course of seven movements played without a break, Beethoven covers an extreme range of emotions, shifting from one to the other with the minimum of preparation. <laughs> 
However much you rehearse, I wonder how it will feel to play the fleeting, frenetic scherzo movement after an ethereal slow movement, or whether we will manage to create a big enough sound in the ferocious final movement. One of the issues is how to get from one movement to the next when the transitions are so abrupt. One of the reasons that Beethoven didn't allow breaks between the movements, I think, is because in the tradition of the time, audiences clapped after each movement. And in, for example, his string quartet, Opus 30, they applauded so much after the second and fourth movements that the performers actually had to repeat those movements right away. And although in some ways that's gratifying, I think he preferred not to make that an option for Opus 131. So the transition between the first and second movements is a good case in point. Two notes, an octave apart. End of first movement. Beginning of the second movement. But how to do that? Should we take the last note of the previous movement and let it die away so that the first notes of the new tune can enter with a totally different character? Or should we sustain our sound on the last slow note to make the join as smooth and continuous as possible? Combining seemingly contradictory thoughts would be ideal. We want to convey the surprise of sudden change, but maintain a sense of logical continuation. Balancing unity and contrast in our interpretation is again an issue in the fourth movement. This slow movement begins with a simple, serene melody supported by basic chords allowing the maximum possibilities for development. In the following variations, Beethoven transforms the theme, creating such a dizzying variety of rhythms, moods, and textures, that sometimes the story is as hard to follow as the boldest jazz improvisation. The most striking innovation comes towards the end of the movement. After each instrument is left on its own to play short exploratory cadenzas, the music recedes almost to nothing before finding its way back to the opening theme, but played now in the second violin and viola parts and surrounded by a radically different accompaniment. The first violin and cello imitate a piccolo flute and drum from a marching band, challenging the ethereal atmosphere that has pervaded much of the previous music. Folk musicians interrupting a solemn gathering. How should the melody react to its irreverent accompaniment. Should it allow itself to be influenced by the accompaniment or not? These are the kind of choices that we can change from one performance to the next, having a kind of range of options up our sleeves. And this adds a great feeling of spontaneity. The ferocity of the seventh and final movement of Opus 131 bears no relation to anything that has preceded it. After so much delicate playing in the earlier movements, this finale with its driving rhythms and belligerent fortissimi now demands the power of a full string orchestra. Will we be able to summon up enough energy to help bring this massive piece to a stirring conclusion? There is a sense of intoxicating danger to this searing final transformation that seems to threaten the structure of the piece and the health of the performers. The risk of losing control lies at the heart of any vivid encounter with a Beethoven quartet. Music that at times consoles, but also has the capacity to destabilize players and listeners alike. Opus 131 ends in a surprising way. The first violin and viola play a descending melody, an exhausted answer to my opening gesture in the whole piece while the second violin and cello's faster rhythm continues to agitate beneath the tune. 
The pleading melody seems to succeed in pacifying the underlying rhythm until from the bottom of the group, Andrash our cellist suddenly reintroduces the faster opening tempo and rhythm, leaping upwards through a C-sharp major arpeggio. We all join in, ending the piece with three fortissimo major chords, a precipitous resolution. However much force we apply to the chords, they cannot fully resolve this immense piece. And we are often greeted by a short, stunned silence. The way in which audiences react to this ending is different from the way they respond to Beethoven's middle works, such as the Fifth Symphony, where the repetition of final chords is so emphatic as to leave one in absolutely no doubt that the ending is upon us. The only question there is which of the many chords will prove to be the very final one, a feature magnificently parodied in Dudley Moore's Beethovenian presentation of Colonel Bogie's March. You can find it on YouTube and I strongly recommend it. But we are unlikely to, at the end of Opus 131 to hear an audience member exclaiming in delighted tones as someone did immediately after the last night of last note of another piece we played at the Wigmore Hall. That's it. To create convincing finality in a piece so varied and which has moved continuously through its seven movements is perhaps an impossibility. In fact, originally Beethoven had planned an eighth movement. This became the slow movement of his next string quartet, Opus 135. At the end of his life, we have the idea of a composer teeming with ideas, originality, and working with the greatest sense of imagination and fantasy. Of all the Beethoven quartets, Opus 131 is the most ambitious. How seven such contrasting movements manage to complement each other and be so convincingly bound together is a miracle no amount of musical analysis can explain. And yet, my judgment of the piece as a satisfying unity is based on many years of experience living with it. When I first encountered this piece, the extremity of its contrast seemed daunting and irreconcilable. But through happy and despairing times, the Beethoven quartets have accompanied the Tokach quartet. No wonder that music, which itself grapples with the balance between unity and contrast, continuity and transformation, has been such a stalwart partner, helping us both to celebrate and withstand change. 30 years ago, when I was a student at the Juilliard School in New York, I had no idea of the ways in which these works could bind the lives of players and listeners together. Music that itself emerged from a complex web of interactions between Beethoven, his patrons and the string players who first rehearsed these works. We look forward very much to presenting two more videos for you. First of all, a concert that will include another of Beethoven's late quartets, Opus 132, the other two pieces on that program, Schubert Quartet Zatz and Bartok's first quartet. And in addition, we will be having a video conversation about the manuscript page of Opus 131, the piece that I've been talking about today. Thank you for watching.